You are listening to the Antler and Feather Co. Podcast. All right. Hey, guys, what's going on? Welcome back to the Antler and Feather Co. Podcast, the podcast for the new hunter, the adult onset hunter, and any other hunter who, like myself, has no idea what we're doing, but we're in the woods anyway because we absolutely love it. Guys, we are already on episode number three. This thing is flying by, and I'm having a great time talking to all these new hunter, or all these experienced hunters, um, and I'm learning a ton of stuff from them, and I hope you guys are too. Uh, we have some really legit guests coming up, so make sure you guys are subscribed and following the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss out on any of the awesome content we got coming your way. So today is going to be chock full of information, uh, especially for us newer hunters. Uh, we're going to talk about everything from what to do after the shot, all the way through foraging for food to complement that meat that you just harvested. Um, I'm really pumped to have our guest on today. Uh, I know I'm going to learn a ton, so I hope you guys too. Let's not waste any time. I'm going to jump right into it. Um, so let's welcome to the podcast, the Edible Outdoors cook, Jason Thornton. Jason, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate it. I, I'm more. I hate to. I hate to admit it, but this is more of a selfish thing than anything. Because I'm. I'm personally really excited because I. I know that. I think I know what I'm doing to an extent, but uh, being able to just gain some knowledge from you, I'm super excited about it, and. Uh, yeah, I, I just couldn't be more more happy to have you on here. Um, I have got a list of questions a mile long. I'm sure I'm sure I'm gonna venture off on tangents, just asking questions that I'm curious about. Um, so hopefully we can pack this thing full for an hour and uh, get a lot of good value out of it. So, like I told you before, I'm gonna open in a quick prayer and then we're, we'll dive right into these questions. So. Lord Jesus, uh, we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross in our place. Um, if not for you, um, our lives would be absolutely just pointless. We would uh, we would be headed to hell and have no hope. And because of what you did on the cross, we can now we can we can just boast in the in the hope that we have, and we know where we're going when when uh, you call us home. And we're just so thankful for that. I'm thankful for Jason that he's taken the time to come on here and teach us some stuff. Um, and I, I just want to glorify you through this podcast. And uh, hopefully we bring, well, you through me um, are able to bring more people into your kingdom as well as get more people into the woods to enjoy the creation that you've made. Um, and we just ask all these things in Jesus name. Amen. Good. All right. So to kick it off, um, I don't want to just totally not let you talk about the Edible Outdoor Cook because I think I've looked at your Instagram and I've looked at it in the middle of a 24-hour fast, and that was the worst possible thing I could have ever done to myself. Um, so can you give a little, just a little background about, you know, where you're from, how long have you been hunting, um, kind of how you got into it, and then just just a little bit about Edible Outdoor Cook, and then we'll get more into the actual project later on. Okay. Uh, again, my name is Jason Thornton. I, uh, I'm i from South Central Louisiana, the steamy, balmy South. You know, I don't know that I've heard anybody say Louisiana from Louisiana. I think really? usually it's it's Louisiana. <laughs> well, I, you know, I just spent all all weekend in the in the heat, and right now I'm, I'm ready to call it Louisiana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I've been hunting. I killed my first deer 37 years ago at the age of 12. I uh, probably killed my first duck about the same time and haven't looked back since. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, where can they find Edible Outdoor Cook online? Uh, so three channels. I've got Instagram, Edible Outdoors Cook, Facebook, Edible Outdoors Cook. And I also have a private blog that you can actually, if you Google Edible Outdoors Cook, you will see the uh, – field to cajun table uh wild game blog yeah i've checked that out and there's uh guys there's recipes there's just it's loaded with information so make sure you write that that website down go check that out because because that's like i said it's a great resource to check into um so i want to kick this off talking about everything 
everything we talk about is, you know, hunting related, getting in the tree, getting in the woods. But what happens when everything lines up, stars align, you arrow a deer or you shoot a deer um, and you put it down? Um, I know the moment you get down from that tree, you're in a completely different world. Um, things don't look the same as they did, but we're going to assume we followed our blood trail or we saw where the deer dropped. What is the after the kill process? Um, most importantly, touch on the importance of field dressing ASAP, ASAP and the reasons for that. Um, and kind of what happens the longer that animal has to sit. So let's say in Iowa, you're, it's in the winter time and you shoot it late at night and you decide, hey, I'm going to give it all night and come back in the morning. So wh why is it so important to get that animal field dressed and out of the woods as soon as you can? Well, <clears throat> as soon as you, you stop the heart, uh, you're on the clock. Uh, again, we, we live in South Louisiana and uh, it's our season runs from September 15th through February 15th. And in September 15th, uh, 90 degree temperatures are, are more common than not. Mm. Um, and again, you're on the clock. You've got to get that animal cooled off as quickly as possible. Um, but before that, making a humane shot uh, is just as important as anything. Uh, getting that animal down as quickly as humanly possible, uh, killing it, uh, stopping the, the heart. Um, now, what I like to do is, uh, you know, get to the animal as soon as possible, honor the animal. Uh, you know, we do take pictures of the animal uh, uh, for, you know, not, our own, not, not for Instagram or, or for Facebook, but just so that we can honor the animal better. Uh, right. We'll eat on that animal all year long. And going back to the pictures helps us to, to actually remember the hunt, uh, remember the, the, the adventure. And uh, it adds uh, to the uh, to the meal. Um, Absolutely. Once you get there, uh, cool it off as quickly as possible. If you can, field dress it. But you've got to be concerned about uh, the conditions in which you're field dressing. Uh, if it's raining or snowing, or if it's hot outside, you have to drag it through mud. Because once you open the cavity, you're exposing it to um, bacteria. Uh, to its own feces, to mm -hmm. mud, to any type of debris that, that would actually, uh, the quality of the meat. Uh, and some people uh, may field dress it in the middle of a swamp, and then if you're going to drag it back and you have to drag it through water and just a ton of stagnant, nasty water. So does that uh, stuff actually, does it, it actually does like seep into the meat? I mean, yes, because you, you, you've, well, you put a hole through both sides of it. So there's a, you know, odds are you've got, uh, you're going to introduce uh, that type of stuff through the, the wound in which you, you killed it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you also the inside, you've got your tenderloins on the inside of the, the cavity, which you definitely don't want to destroy. And if you're going to do that, right. I would suggest maybe you remove the tenderloins. Right. You, uh, you know, field dress the animal and remove the tenderloins. Keep the heart and the liver. Uh, I like to eat nose to tail. Um, so if, if you're so inclined, you might want to keep a, a, a game sack, uh, just for those, those parts. Uh, and I'm not saying that field dressing is evil. Uh, you know, sometimes it is, it's a necessity if it's going to be out, uh, if you're going to be away from your truck or, or your skinning shed for quite some time, uh, go ahead and do it. Uh, also, you know, it lightens the load. There, there's a lot yeah. of innards in there that, you know, sometimes it, if I can, Field dress the animal, it might take me an extra 30 minutes off my, my drag time. Uh, so it all boils down to, to cooling the animal off as quickly as possible. And you'll see pictures of people, and they'll they'll kill a nice buck or whatever type of animal, and they'll put it in the back of the truck, and they'll ride around town showing all their <laughs> friends. And, yep. you know, they'll stop at every gas station and, and talk to people. And, you know, they shot the buck at 8 o'clock in the morning, and now it's 6.30 in the afternoon, and yeah. you know, they're still showing it off. Well. You know, at that point, the quality of your meat is is diminishing, you know, by the minute at that point. I like to have the animal from when it when I drop the animal to you know, actually hanging up and cleaning it. I'd rather be no more than, you know, 90 minutes or two hours or so. 
Um, yeah. So, but that is the very beginning of the quality meat process. I mean, so could you, you imagine have- it if if your if your rancher killed a, a cat killed cattle, and then you know eighteen hours <laughs> that's later, that's a great still, way to that's a great way to meat. think about it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a perspective that I haven't heard before. Um, that's actually a really good way to think about it. So would you, let's assume, so where I'm hunting in Iowa, I generally where I'm going to be, um, I don't, I wouldn't say I have like a long drag in most situations. Um, it's still, you know, when you're, when you're dragging dead weight, especially if it's by yourself, um, or a lot of times I'll go in on a canoe, so I got to bring it out on water. Um, but if you're one of those guys, let's say you, you decided, Hey, I heard that sometimes you get lucky if you hunt right off the parking lot or something like that, you've got a pretty, pretty easy drag. Would you recommend just dragging it to your truck and field dressing it in kind of a more controlled environment? If you do have, you know, you have a shorter drag. Absolutely. But even more importantly, I'd like to field dress it with the access of running water, you know, okay. uh, a skinning shed or your, your your barn or wherever you're, you're cleaning your animals. Uh, if, if your truck is only 10 minutes away from, from that, I just go ahead and wait the extra 10 minutes because running water, clean running water is essential to, to meat quality. You okay. can, you know, urine or feces or whatever else that you accidentally bile stomach material. If you, if you made a poor shot, uh, you can actually salvage a lot of meat with clean, fresh running water. Okay. One thing you touched on that I, I'm curious about, and I, we don't have to deep dive into the scientific uh, part behind it, but like you mentioned the importance of making a good shot and getting that animal down quickly. What, what can happen or what happens when you make a poor shot, maybe you gut shot it, or maybe you, whatever it is, and that animal does not drop, you know, in the 40 to hundred yard range and they're running for a mile and maybe they have to lay down for a few hours to die. What about that affects the meat quality? Now I kind well, of that, know the answer to that, but I'd like you to share that yeah. with people who don't understand what happens during, when that, when that shot goes off and they run off and you don't find them for a while, what happens to that meat? Well, the deer it, you know, is inject is injecting itself with, with adrenaline. You've, you've shot the deer and you scared the heck out of it and it runs a mile. Uh, it's just tainted with adrenaline, which is not good for the meat. And then maybe you bump it a couple more times. Uh, and then maybe it does take you all night to recover it uh, once it's dead because, you know, a deer can run a lot faster than I can walk looking for it. So right. say it runs half a mile, um, you know, and it covers that half mile in six minutes and lays down and dies. Well, honestly, it's going to take you probably four, five, six hours to find a deer at a half mile. Uh, even if you've got a decent blood trail, it's going to take you a long time. And it goes back to the clock is ticking. Uh, once that animal beds and dies, you find it five hours later, you know, you're, you're on the clock. Uh, uh, you definitely want to get it cooled off at that point. And if you're in Iowa and the you know, temperatures are, you know, you're hunting and it's, it's 29 degrees, uh, your clock is a little slower than my clock. My clock, mm-hmm. uh, if I'm if I'm hunting during the rut, it could be seventy degrees. Uh, oh, not to mention, uh, <laughs> hey, South Louisiana. Not to mention, do, now do you're in you competition do. with every coyote in, in the right county. Uh, ants, uh, fire ants, whatever you know, whatever other uh, predators that you may have in your area. Wolves, if, if you're if you're in that part of the area. Um, I've actually, and I can shoot you some pictures. I shot a, a small buck. It's been years ago. And maybe 20 minutes after I pulled the trigger, a bobcat walked by. Oh. So I, no, that's me. Uh, before I can get a shot on it, because I, I would shoot it, uh, ended up, it was actually blood trailing my deer. Wow. And by the time I got to my deer, it had taken a front shoulder off the, the deer. Really? I mean, it, it had a, a hole the size of a softball in the shoulder. <laughs> Now, do you help itself to a to a fine meal? Yeah, do you, in a situation like that, um, I'm sure you. I've ha- I had a buddy a year or two ago. Same thing happened. He shot one later at night, and uh, 
Yeah, he came first thing in the morning. I think it wasn't even light out yet to to try to try to find it. And yeah, it was completely gone, like down to the bones. Let's say in your situation, when if that does happen, is that meat just done then, or did like in your situation, were you able to salvage anything because it kind of happened so quickly, or is yes. there is there a concern with having an, another live animal eating on that that carcass? No, I, I, I wouldn't be concerned with it. If you can salvage, like in this case, the bobcat had a front shoulder. So I just donated the front shoulder to this little, you know, quad pad that, that upset mm-hmm. me. Uh, <laughs> the deer's not, the deer's not, you know, it, the, the blood is stopping the deer. So it's not like it's, it's taking saliva from the bobcat and it's, it's being, you know, uh, it's being sent throughout the body of, of the dead right. deer. So it was just that area. Uh, so I, I was perfectly comfortable with with salvaging the rest of the deer now you know in your buddy's case where the the coyotes decimated the entire thing you know makes for a really good story and some some cool pictures but it still upsets right you. yeah he lost he lo- he lost the back straps on that it was a shame but <laughs> um so if you let's say you do everything right and uh or you think you do everything right what is a way to tell like if if something is wrong with the meat, maybe it did sit too long or whatever the situation may be. How can you tell if that meat is no longer edible or salvageable? Um, whether it has to do with how long it took you to get it to wherever you went to process it, um, or maybe you processed it and you used bad practices to age it or co- put it in a cooler. What are some telltale signs that that meat is probably not what you're, you're probably not going to want to eat that. Uh, well, the first thing is smell. You can smell uh, poor meat uh, at any point, a- anywhere, uh, whether it be beef or, or lamb or, or venison. Uh, and the next thing is vision. Your, your, your visual cues will help you out a lot. Uh, it just doesn't look right. Um, maybe there have already been uh, insects that are, are involved. Mm-hmm. Flies can be a big thing here in, uh, in South Louisiana. So, you know, if you've already got flies on your animal and uh, you know it's been out for a while, um, you know, nobody wants to eat, you know, fly larva or maggots. Right. Uh, but the next thing is just the way it, it tastes. Um, I shot a pronghorn years ago in Wyoming and it was hot when I shot it and everything looked good. I, I, I got to the animal quickly. Uh, I harvested it fast. It was still hot. Uh, put it on ice. And at some point between Wyoming and Louisiana, it just did not survive the trip. And I didn't give me any clues at all. Uh, I couldn't smell poor meat. I couldn't, I didn't see any visual cues that, that were off. But when I cooked it, um, everybody in the house knew it was wrong. <laughs> so, you know, just, just follow your gut. If it doesn't smell good, don't eat it. Okay. I wholeheartedly believe that you should, you know, you know, I wouldn't even feed it to my dog. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, because you, you don't want to get anybody sick. The last thing you want to do is, is to get your family sick or, or friends sick. And, and, you know, just because you, you handle it poorly, or in my case, I, I did everything correctly in Wyoming. I, I don't, I still am not sure exactly where, where I went South with the whole process, but, but it was rancid. Yeah. So I know it, this is going to, this next question is going to be a little difficult to explain without having like a visual of it, but once you've got that animal field dress and you get him home, you get him to your skinning shed, wherever it is, you're going to break this animal down. Can you kind of just go over what your process is? Um, I've seen people hang it by the head. I've seen people hang it by the leg. I've seen people do the whole cut the neck and let it bleed thing. Um, so what? How, how do you handle it? Once you get that thing, you get the guts out, what's your next step? Um, so. I'll hang it upside down, legs, uh, by the back legs. I'll skin it out completely, um, and then depending on what your your rules are in your state, uh, for us we have to tag it on the hawk, uh, okay. and keep um, keep evidence of sex. Uh, so the head and the and the hawk, skin it out completely, and then I I start uh, I'll pull the front shoulders off, and then I'll pull the back straps off. Then I'll go inside and take out the tenderloins, cut off the ribs, 
cut off the um, the backbone, and I'll discard the backbone because at that point, the back straps and the tendon loins are gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I will go into the legs, the, the hind legs, and uh, cut them in half and refrigerate all of it. Okay. Uh, we don't like you mentioned earlier that you don't have a walk-in cooler. Uh, I don't either. Uh, there's ways to get around it. It's very difficult, but uh, if you're motivated, you can get around it. Uh, what I like to do is I'll take a very large ice chest, like a 162 quart ice chest, and I'll put a layer of ice in it uh, at the very bottom. Then I'll put my venison. Uh, I'll put a garbage bag over the ice, and then I'll put my venison uh, over the garbage bag. I do not like getting my venison wet at all. Um, I find that it turns gray, uh, a mealy looking gray. Mm-hmm. And that's just not a, appealing to my eye. Um, if you went uh, to your meat market and you were looking at ribeyes and it was that color, you wouldn't buy it. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So it turns it turns the meat to a, a gray looking matter. And I don't like it. I like it red. Um, but the reason I do all that uh, is just to keep you. I'm, I'm essentially pr- uh, I'm creating my own walk-in cooler. By keeping it that way, You're, I'm going to keep it that way for uh, s- several days. I'll keep the drain plug open, uh, and I'll elevate the uh, opposite side of the ice chest so that it continues. The water continues to drain, uh, and it's never sitting in a pool of water. So, do you at any point in time? I guess before I answer, ask this question, how many days will you leave it in that cooler before it's time to take it out and actually break down your muscle groups and things like that? It depends on the outside temperature. If it's cold outside, I'll leave it that way for a while. But if it's warm outside, I don't care what kind of cooler you're using. If you've got that drain plug open, the ice goes quickly. Um, I would like to hold it ideally for about three or four days in that um, in that ice chest. And then I have an entire kitchen counter in my house dedicated to processing deer. And it's a family event. Uh, I'll mm-hmm. bring, I'll drag the ice chest in. And all four of us get to get to work on the deer. Uh, I've got a a 17 year old son and a 13 year old daughter and my wife. And we get after it. And it probably takes us uh, from that point of bringing in the house to putting it into the wrapped, sealed, labeled, put in the freezer about an hour. Really? And what I well, what we like to do is we'll break, break down the muscle groups, the hind leg. I'll break it down into the, the, um, I'll, I'll, there's probably this, I think there's like six muscle groups in the in the back leg, each back leg, with top round, bottom round. Uh, we call it the hidden tenderloin. It's the eye of round. Okay. The shank. Break it all down into those muscle groups, and then the football roast. Break it down, label it, put it away. I use the front shoulders. Um, we will um, we'll debone the front shoulders. And I use that for uh, my ground pile. All that goes to the grinder. Okay. Uh, and that's the only part of the animal that I use uh, for grind. Other than trim work, we'll, uh, you know, whatever trim work comes off the deer will go to the ground pile. And then people like to keep roasts. The only roast, per se, that I keep is the neck. Really? How, how does that? That's one cut of the deer that. I don't think I've ever been around anybody that has kept the neck and I've always heard like that that is good meat and there's meat there, but I don't think I, I don't think I've ever really understood like which part of it, it it would like, what, what is the part you take and how, you know, what do you do with it? So what I take is pretty much just below the jaw, the jawline of the animal all the way down to where you stop pulling the back strap out. Okay. And depending on the size of the deer, on a good, you know, 130 pound doe, you might have a, a five or six pound roast. Really? Uh, it's bone in, obviously. And you've got to remove the esophagus and the trachea it's right down the middle of it. But there is a ton of meat on it. And we cook it low and slow. Um, and then I will, uh, at one point, probably, you know, maybe six or seven hours into the process, I'll remove the spine from the from the animal it's in a pot and all you now you have is juice and meat in the pot remove the spine from that dish and i like to use it uh you like uh, uh pulled pork 
But it's yeah. not pulled pork, it's pulled venison. Uh, I'll make French dip sandwiches, pulled pulled venison sandwiches. I'll put them on nachos, tacos, um, breakfast burritos. It's just a ton of meat on it. And uh, it's probably one of my favorite cuts. Yeah, and especially, like I said, I feel like that's one of the most overlooked, like, pieces of meat. And I know, I know some people take from, you know, around the, I guess, the knee joint, if you will. I know a lot of people just kind of cut it off right up, right up top of the knee joint, and then everything else gets tossed out. And what, what is that? Is that shanks or whatever? Is that the what they call it? Shanks are the bottom part, the, essentially what, what's the calf on your leg. Yeah, tank on a, on a deer. Now going back to the, to the neck and the roast, the neck roast. You're really going to pay attention to CWD if you've got CWD in your area. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, but you're keeping that spinal column, so you may not want to consider a neck roast if CWD is a thing in your area. That's a good. Uh, that's again, a good point. I do not want to get anybody sick, including myself. Uh, I don't have to worry about that. We don't have it in South Louisiana yet, so. Uh, I keep the whole thing, but the spine is, is one of the big parts that you have to worry about with CWD. Awesome. So one last little, not to jump all the way back, but when, when you have your meat in a cooler, you put that one layer of ice. Is that pretty much your time, uh, your time frame? Like as soon as that ice is out, you're pulling it out. Do you ever, like the way I was taught, like you put it on the ice and then you put ice on top of it. And as it drains and melts away, add ice to it and add ice to it. D do you kind of just put that first initial layer, get your meat in there, and whenever that ice is about done, you you get it out? Or not necessarily. Uh, it really depends on what's going on in, in my life. If that initial layer were to go away in a day, I'm I'm probably going to add another. Uh, I'll take the meat out, redo the whole thing, put ice in the bottom, garbage bag, meat on top again. Um, okay. It's not. I, I'll be honest with you. It really depends on what's happening in my personal life. Yeah. <laughs> Kids, jobs, uh, Christmas parties at that point. I mean, it just really depends. If, if I'm in a time crunch, then I might, I may escalate the whole process by two days. Uh, if, if I have nothing else going on four or five days. So what happens to the meat over a course of like, what I, uh, why wouldn't you feel dress? Uh, go through your whole breakdown process. Why? Why don't you just put it right into the freezer at that point? Like, what? It, what happens when you let it? I guess age for three, yeah. four, five, six days. What? What does that do for the meat to to make it beneficial? So you are aging it in your cooler. Uh, the in the enzymes in the meat are starting to break the meat down, uh, so it will be a little bit more tender. Uh, it will be a little bit more tasty. Uh, just because those en enzymes are, are doing their thing with the meat. Uh, ideally, if I had a walk-in cooler, I'd probably, and I could control the temperature, I would probably let it hang there for at least a week, a week okay. to 10 days. Uh, but that is a super controlled walk-in cooler, uh, whereas an ice chest is not, right? Um, but, and you can actually tell the difference between an animal that was aged four days and an animal that was put away immediately. Yeah. Conversely, you can tell the difference between an animal that was aged four days and an animal that was aged 10 days. Um, now, it's hard to compare apples to apples because, you know, as soon as you try to conduct this experiment, well, this doe is younger than the other doe, which makes right. for better meat, or this buck. But if you compare apples to apples, aging the animal is definitely beneficial for the, for the table. Awesome. So, and then to wrap up this little segment on, on the, after the kill, if you do have, maybe you're somebody who you don't want to, you don't want to break down the whole animal, which, you know, there's a, there, there's many different beliefs behind it. I, I kind of feel like if I take the time to put all the work into a hunt and I put that animal down, I owe it to that animal to do everything on my own instead of just, well, I killed it. I'm going to send you off to a butcher that's my personal belief on it. Doesn't have to be anybody else's, but if you're going to take it to a processor, or maybe you just don't want to go through making sausage and all the fancy stuff, 
do you really just need to field dress it and then get it to the butcher ASAP? Or are there other things you should do before you take it into the butcher? Um, you may want to take your select cuts off. Um, when I was doing this years and years ago, uh, I wouldn't bring the back strap to the butcher. Uh, I can I can take that and I can process it myself. Uh, I don't want anybody, you know, you hear horror stories where people, butchers will take their, their cut or whatever. And yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure they really do that because some of these guys are, are just seeing 200 deer a year. Right. Uh, you know, why he's taking a sliver of backstrap off your deer. And not, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they are. But, uh, you know, I, I don't subscribe to that. But I, would, I wouldn't bring my backstraps or my tenderloins uh, there. I would bring him all the, the, the four legs. Um, but I, I guess it depends on what you do with it from there. You know, if he's going to debone it and cut into chops or make sausage or ground or whatever they're doing, I wouldn't pay a whole bunch of attention with aging it. Uh, just because they're going to get it, they're going to get it and they're going to, they're going to cut the heck out of it and throw mm -hmm. it in a grinder. They're going to mix it with some pork or something else maybe. And then they're going to shoot it through sausage with, with their, their special seasoning. Uh, I just wouldn't put a whole bunch of attention into into um, anything special between you know the skinning shed and the butcher. I, right. I just wouldn't. Yeah, so I guess um, it'd be beneficial if you're going to do that. Maybe just call ahead and say, "Hey, what kind of what kind of condition do you want this animal in?" If I bring one in, yeah. and I'm sure they'll they'll let you know what no. they like. You know, most of them charge extra for deboning the deer. So okay. you know, if you're inclined to save a couple of couple of dollars, you may want to debone it. Uh, and bring it to them deboned. That way you can save, you know, 20, 30 bucks or whatever it'll be. Right. Um, you know, I know some of those meat processing places, uh, especially in Texas, people drop off a whole deer. And this is what yeah. I want. They fill out a, they fill out a checklist. I want this, that, and the other. And, you know, 14 days later, they call them and there's, you know, it's wrapped and they, they've made everything that they want to, but they, they process the entire deer for people. Uh, I like to be a little bit more hands-on than that. I like to to get into it, and uh, my 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 venison doesn't see anybody but you know the four people that live under my roof, right? Uh, until it be, until it goes to the um, you know into this kitchen, and and I I serve friends uh, venison, but we're the only four people that touch my meat. Yeah, that sounded bad. That's <laughs> I was just gonna let it go and hope <laughs> nobody, <laughs> but. Uh... So transitioning out of transitioning out of that, another thing that you do that I think is super interesting, and this is an area where I have absolutely no experience in. Um, and I, again, this is a selfish part of me wanting to talk to you because I really want to learn about it. So you are big into foraging. Um, for people who may have never heard that term or have heard it and just don't really understand what it means, when you're foraging, what are you doing? So in Louisiana, we have several different things that we forage for. It starts off with uh, blackberries in the spring. Uh, and there are a ton of different areas uh, in the state that you can pick just an amazing amount of blackberries. Uh, and I go from blackberries to mushrooms. Uh, normally that's... Um, chanterelle mushrooms in the summer and oyster mushrooms in the winter. And I, matter of fact, I was, I was, I found a good little bit this morning. Yeah, um, I saw that. So what I'm looking to do is, uh, and it's very specific atmospheric conditions that you're looking for. The chanterelle mushrooms love a good rain. So it, we had that Friday morning and in the back of my head, while it's raining on Friday, I was already working my, <laughs> my process at all right, Sunday, I'll be looking for some mushrooms. Um, the chanterelle mushrooms, uh, they grow in uh, near sloughs or waterways, uh, places that where the ground is moist uh, but doesn't flood. So the, the banks of a river, uh, the banks of a slough, creek, stream, just someplace where it stays moist, uh, under hardwood trees, mostly oak trees. And <clears throat> you can – I've gotten to the point now to where – I'll be riding on my side by side and I'm 10, 15 miles per hour. And I'll just, I can spot one <laughs> like it's, you know, an adult Easter egg. Yeah. So I slam on the brakes and, and hop out and go and, and, and grab it. 
what I like to do is thump the cap a couple of times and get the spores out of it, kind of reassure future growth mm-hmm. and then harvest the mushroom and, and uh, put it in a basket. Uh, that way the spores can continue to fall out of the basket through the, the weavings. Um, so then uh, mushrooms are a big deal. And then it transitions to muscadines, which is a wild grape. Uh, and I saw a ton of wild grapes today. Uh, that storm that came through Friday knocked a whole bunch of uh, non-ripe muscadines out of the tree. Mm. And what I, I like to do is uh, make jelly with the muscadines. Uh, but I'm probably about two months away from a good ripening. Um, and then it goes into the fall, the oyster mushrooms, a little bit different than chanterelles. They grow on dead wood. And <clears throat> again, the atmospheric conditions kind of dictate their, uh, their blooming. What, what you're looking for is a, uh, a strong foggy uh, morning. And once you, whatever creates a strong fog, foggy morning, uh, you can pretty much rest assured the next day you'll have oyster mushrooms growing on rotting wood. Um, and the good thing is that once you find clusters of them, that the mycelium, which is the, the, essentially the root system of the mushrooms, you can harvest, if you do it correctly, you harvest mushrooms on the same rotting log for, you know, the rest of your life. Um, really? And, and the way I do that with the moisture mushrooms is I'll cut, I won't even, I won't, you don't pull them off the, pull them off the tree. That'll kill the mycelium. So you cut it at the, at the base. And uh, they'll continue to grow there for years and years and years. That's awesome. How'd you get into like, was that just something your family did or how did you start doing that? No, actually um, a buddy of mine, uh, shout out to uh, to my buddy outside the levees uh, YouTube channel. Uh, he and I became um, <clears throat> social media friends several years ago and he was big into it and got me into it. But, you know, I did not grow up doing this and I wish I would have. Uh, but it's been, you know, several years now that I've gotten hot and heavy into it. There's some really good YouTube channels to learn how to do it because there's different mushrooms in different areas, right? You don't, you You're may right. not have chanterelle mushrooms in Iowa. I'm not sure. You, We're big you on morels really up good here. Morels, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, and that's the king of the mushroom. Uh, yeah. We don't have morels here. Uh, chanterelles are the next best thing. So <clears throat> just got into it. Uh, figure out who you can learn from because not everybody on YouTube is is legitimately worth that was my time. next question where's the best where have you found the best resources because uh, eating wild plants or mushroom like <laughs> you really want to make sure that you got the right one you know <laughs> uh so there are some good field guides to um to it uh i'd be willing to bet every state has got their own uh mycology uh facebook group uh, mm-hmm. foraging Facebook group. We have Louisiana has a really good one. Uh, and you can let them know, Hey, I'm, I'm new to it. Take a picture of it, take several pictures of it because everybody wants to see the underside of the mushroom, the cap, the underside and what it's growing on. Uh, there's a difference between uh, a mushroom that's growing from the earth and a mushroom that's growing from rotting wood. Mm-hmm. Um, and so take those three pictures, send it out to your group. And then wait for the consensus. Don't wait for the first person to come back. <laughs> uh, wait for the consensus. And then uh, you'll learn it quickly. Uh, some of the book, the field guides out there are very good. Uh, and they'll tell you, uh, like a chanterelle mushroom, what to look for. And then they'll tell you what the lookalike is and what to look for with that. Uh, the chanterelle mushroom, the lookalike is the jack-o'-lantern. Uh, it is toxic, but not deadly. So if you make a mistake of eating it, you know, you're, <laughs> you just, you, you just be sitting by the toilet all Pick night. Pick wisely. Of, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, you know, the jack o lantern grows on dead wood. The chanterelle grows from the earth. So that's okay. your first clue. Um, uh, and then, you know, there's probably mycology groups that, that meet. Um, you, whatever state university you have probably has a pretty good mycology group. Um and just pick their brains, uh, send pictures. There's another really good, uh, there's an app. Picture this, phenomenal app. Um, you take a picture of the, whatever it is you're looking at, and it'll tell you what the, uh, what the plan is. And it's been my That's experience awesome. that this app is about 97% accurate. Um, started off in your backyard with trees and, and plants that you know. Take a picture of the leaf, 
and it'll tell you it's an American fig tree. I'm like, man, that is it's it's incredible. It is probably one of the best tools that you can have on your smartphone. Uh, I highly recommend it for anybody. Picture this. Yeah, that's a great that's a great resource, and uh, I'm curious about you said ninety seven percent. What happened with the three <laughs> percent? Well, that, I think that's the number. I'll they just count. Right, so, right. Uh, you're pretty yeah. safe. You probably won't die. Um, right. You mentioned figs, and that's one thing I was when I was scrolling through your Instagram account on that day. I was fasting. I just happened to go through like all these preserves and stuff you made with them. Um, did you, do you kind of, did you just kind of go online and look up what to do with them? Or did you have someone teach you how to make all that stuff? And I saw you made like preserves out of like, uh, wild, like blackberries or something like that. And man, did it look good. But like, how do you know, where'd you learn to do all that? That comes from the family. Uh, Mm Um, my, my grandparents were really big, uh, you know, outdoors people. They probably had to be in that, in the great depression. Yeah, you, know, you 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 eat what you can, and you know you eat seasonally, right? So blackberries in the spring, that's what you had, you know, as your dessert. Or blackberries in the spring, uh, in the fall you had different things. You had persimmons. Um, so you know, my grandfather grew up uh, very poor, uh, so they ate off the land. Uh, my great grandfather uh, was a market hunter, and he shot uh, quail and, and ducks for uh, for customers. Um, so that, that knowledge to answer your question has been passed down for several generations. That's awesome. And if you guys, so if you go to his website, there's a part where there's, uh, I can't remember which part it's called, but you'll know when you get there, there's a couple different videos that you have on that, um, of appearances you've made. And there was one video where I think it was at your property and you were going through and you made these hand pies. (sighs) my god that looks so good and i'm like that looks like something i could do and that's kind of what got me interested in like just asking you about foraging because like it's kind of a, it's not as intimidating as like taking on hunting i guess to me anyway but like i'm not really a a, a cook like i can cook all right and i can cook good enough but when you get into like if I pull up a recipe and there's like more than five ingredients, I'm usually out at that point. I pick the big names that I know, throw it in there and hope to God it tastes okay. Um, but that's one of the things that about what you're doing is your recipes and stuff seem to be pretty darn simple and they turn out amazing. But it, it's something that I feel like, oh, I could do that. And then that spurs me to want to go try, you know, foraging for whatever I do have around here because I feel, I feel like it's not outside of my reach. Like usually, you know, you you've got your people who they are cooks and they're very good at it, and it, not everybody has that. But I think you're making making the wild game and uh, just just I guess everything from the wild using that to create great meals and food. Like it, it makes it feel like oh, I can do that. And not out of my reach. So I think that's that's awesome um, with your edible outdoors cook. Like that, that's the thing that appealed to me the most is I don't feel like you're making these fancy things that I'll never be able to make. And uh, so before I want to talk a little bit about your edible, the, just your edible outdoors cook thing. Um, do you have, this is my question when I was, I was thinking about foraging and it goes back to the 3%. Do you have any bad experiences when you foraged anything? Have you ever accidentally ate the wrong thing or had some kind of crazy reactions or are you lucky so no, far? <laughs> not at all. Uh, matter of fact, I, I've, I've been quite lucky uh, in the whole process. Uh, everything that uh, has been, all the knowledge that's been passed on to me has been accurate and, uh, and beneficial. Uh, and I like doing the same thing with, with people like yourself. Uh, that's actually the reason I started Edible Outdoors Cook. Um, we hunt a lot of ducks. We shoot a lot of deer. And, you know, everywhere I would go, they would serve ducks to me. And it was wrapped with, you know, wrapped, cream, wrapped it with cream cheese and bacon and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and cookie. I'm like, Lord, you, you, shoot, you shoot 200 ducks a year. How much bacon and cream cheese are you eating? <laughs> right. So I was like, man, you know, why aren't people doing other things with this? 
And, you know, I was a victim of it myself 25 years ago. And we're just so blessed, uh, especially here on the Gulf, where I, I did a lot of fishing. And I'd open up my freezer and there was grouper and there was snapper and there was redfish and speckled yeah. trout. And, you know, and the majority of people fry everything. I mean, it's South right. Museum, that's what you do. I mean, there's got to be more to this. You know, if I go, if you go to a quality restaurant out in town and they've got grouper on the menu, well, you know, it's a, a $45 plate of food. And I've got this ingredient in my freezer. How come I can't, right. you know, turn out a dish that is a $45 dish? Well, I can. So that was kind of the inspiration towards everything that I just wanted to get better with the quality ingredients that I was being provided by, by the great outdoors, whether it be you know, small game or venison or turkey, ducks, or even fish. Um, and now foraging. I mean, I, I, I made a dish the other day and it was, it was grilled backstrap with a, a chanterelle cream sauce on top of it. Mm. I know I can serve that to people and they want to pay 50 bucks for it. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is all openly and readily available to me. Yeah. Uh, and the same thing with you, you've got morel mushrooms and you've got, you know, quality venison and, and I, you know, there's no reason any, any one of your listeners couldn't just learn a couple of things and uh, apply it to their outdoors. Uh, what I like to tell people, and I, I probably answer two dozen questions a day, uh, just from, <laughs> from people I've never even heard of. Uh, you know, I don't know them, and I'm happy to answer them because I yeah. want everybody to do this. Um, but if you have a really uh, a beef dish that you really like, you can do that with venison. I guarantee you, you can. Uh, the cook times may be a little bit different because the portions are smaller. Uh, but if you're going to use the same cut of venison that they, that they use for that beef dish, you can you, you can cook the exact same dish. I don't care what it is. Beef Wellington. You can make venison Wellington. You can do whatever. Um, shish kebabs. Just whatever your favorite beef dish is, substitute venison. You might want to cook it a little bit less and then go from there. Um, with venison, you have to cook it less because there's, there's a lot less fat marbled mm -hmm. into the meat. So it'll tend to dry out much quicker. Uh, uh, duck hunting. Uh, when when it comes to cooking ducks, you cannot overcook a duck. Um, if you're going to cook a duck breast, and I like to cook my duck breast very much like I like to cook my steaks, uh, medium rare. Uh, I'll sear the outside, put a crust on it. But uh, a duck breast has got this this crazy uh, property in it where if you cook it correctly, medium rare, it tastes very much like beef. Really, very much like beef. Yes, but as soon as you cook it past medium, it tastes like liver. <laughs> so that's where, where people get turned off with with ducks. I've never had duck that I like. Well, it's probably because you cooked it for 12 hours. It's yeah. horrible. But if you cook it for four minutes on one side, flip over three minutes on the other side, and I, I serve it to you, you will never eat duck any other way. Yeah. Have you always been, like, have you always been into cooking? Do you have any, like, formal, like, culinary background? Or did you just kind of, it just evolved as you grew up hunting you just got tired of eating boring venison dishes or the same old stuff. Cause it seems like everybody does the cream cheese bacon wrap for everything. And you, that's Bandy about bites. as fancy as it usually gets. <laughs> so yep. did you just get bored with that and, and, and pursue it from there or what, what's your background with that? So growing up, uh, my dad and my little brother and I would cook, uh, one night a week. My mom would go off. She had a, a, a bowling league she'd go to. So the, the three men would get together and we'd cook something different every Monday night. Now I'm talking, I'm probably eight, nine, 10 years old at this time. And some of the stuff was phenomenal, but some of it we'd throw away. I mean, <laughs> honestly, but you know, I learned techniques, I learned different techniques along the way. And then um, I got into the military. And if you ever wanted to be a popular person in the platoon, know how to cook. And yeah. know how to cook in <laughs> know how to cook in the field. Uh, because there's nothing better than you serving people, you know, pretty good food compared to what is shelf stable that they give you in an MRA. Right. Right. Uh, and then from there, uh got out, did a whole bunch of hunting and fishing, uh, try to uh make up for lost time when I was in the Marines. And then <clears throat> got got to a point where uh I went to a couple of cooking classes. Um, 
and nothing, you know, I'm not a chef. I'm not a, a culinary genius. So I beg uh, to differ. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and I, I guess it just depends on your definition of chef, but uh, went to a couple of cooking classes and just continue to evolve learning techniques, reading a lot. Uh, I have a pretty vast uh, cookbook recipe, uh, cookbook uh, library. Um, follow some people on, uh, on YouTube that are really good. Uh, there are some, some geniuses out there, phenomenal people. Um, I like to watch B- Bobby Flay on, mm-hmm. uh, at night when I'm in bed and, and just learning techniques. And, you know, if you learn seven or eight different techniques, that'll get you through 95% of your cooking. Uh, yeah. Same thing with seasoning. You don't have to buy a ton of seasonings to get you through. Uh, salt, pepper, onion powder, garlic powder, uh, paprika, smoked paprika. That'll just get the you basics. through the majority of just the basis will get you through the majority of what you want to do. That's awesome. So it's just, it, it's an evolution of, of, of the trade craft. And I wanted to do that because it brings hunting full circle. Yeah. You know, if you stop at an animal and taking a picture and you give it all away, I just, I don't find that very interesting at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to shoot an animal to stop at that point. Yeah. Um, I want to shoot an animal to stop when I've got four or five good friends over with my family and their families and I serve them this, this dish and like, Oh my God. And then we talk about it. You know, you've got your hunting buddies like everybody else and probably 80% of the deer that I have harvested in the last 20 years have been with one of my three or four really good hunting buddies. So, you know, when we serve this up, I can always tell them that was that, that six point that we shot. Yeah. behind the hill barn and you know we're eating it and we're reliving that entire story again and if i got to tell anybody anything man, shoot it makes you happy you know mm-hmm. uh, we're we're a society where we're watching youtube videos and the outdoor channel and they're passing on 160 inch deer yeah because they're trying to wait for mr stickers because they've been following him for three years i mean that that's that doesn't happen in real life often. Right. You know, right. So, you know, if you see a six point and that's your deer, that's your deer, claim it, be happy with it and, and move on. Uh, some of my favorite hunting stories are two does and a Nokia. Yeah. I, I, I tell people all the time and they're phenomenal stories. And I, I will, you know, I cherish those stories that I would, I was with my hunting buddy, all three of them. And, you know, it was just, you know, those are my stories. Three, excuse me, two does in a, in a Nokia. Yeah, that's a, that's one of the one of the biggest things I enjoy about harvesting an animal and eating is exactly what you said. You're not just eating a meal when you go to the store and grab a ribeye or you grab a sir whatever it is you might get. You're just eating. You're eating for the sake of eating, and there's nothing more to it. But there's just something extra. There's something like just built into us that when you sit down and you can you can explain like the whole, it comes with a story. And uh, I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's a part of hunting that getting to like the people who might be listening, who are kind of like, uh, I want to start, but I'm not really sure where, or I'm a little intimidated the whole process. That's one of the sweetest things of, of hunting, you know, one is just being in creation, seeing the woods wake up, but two sitting around a table and being able to tell the story of the meal you're eating. And even to a, to a greater extent, when you like for you, when you get into foraging, like it all comes with a story. And I think that just makes the, it it makes it more than just food and it makes it, 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 it not to sound cliche or dumb about it, but it's like food for your stomach and your soul. And, uh, you know, I, that's one thing for newer hunters that maybe they haven't killed one yet, or maybe they haven't just decided to start yet. Just know that like that part of the process is, is worth every little thing that you're scared of right now. Sorry, my dog's clicking in the background. <laughs> Any part of it. He's a, uh, he's an English pointer, not to venture off. He uh, should be a gun dog, but he's completely deaf and he yeah. doesn't hunt, but everyone's like, Oh, he should, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be gun shy. <laughs> but uh but no that's that's one of the uh on the far side or on the on the other side of hunting those things those experiences are are make it all worth it as well 
Um, I just, and, and I like what you brought up too, especially coming from someone like you, who's very, very experienced, uh, with hunting. I see it on Facebook every single year where, well, here's my picture. It's just a doe. I shot a spike today, but I don't even want to post a picture of it because people are worried they're going to get shamed and they will on certain Facebook groups. Um, guys, as a new hunter, if, if God puts an animal in front of you and that animal has your heart, just, just going, that's your animal. Take it. Don't, don't be shamed by it. Don't feel like you need to be embarrassed of it. Once you start hunting and understand how difficult getting an animal on the ground is, how much work, how much time, man, most everybody around you, we, everyone is going to be so excited for you. So just if there's one little, there's a ton of information that you need to learn or that you can learn from, from this episode, but that's just an extra one on there. Don't be afraid of what other people are going to say. And maybe you, I did this myself, my first day out hunting, I passed on a bunch of smaller deer because I'm in Iowa and all I've ever heard is Iowa is full of giants. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to wait for a big one. I didn't see another deer the entire rest of the year <laughs> because I, I let my ego get into it. And I thought, oh, no, I'm going to wait for a big one. Guys, the, the opportunity doesn't come around as often as you might think it will. Um, like he said, you watch YouTube and you watch all these other outdoors channels it seems like every time they step in the woods, they've got a 200 inch deer that pops out and it works out well and it's perfect. That's not real hunting. Um, so don't pass on opportunities if you, if you do get them. So enough of that tangent. Back to your cooking. Do you, now I know you have recipes and stuff on your website. Um, do you, or have you considered making like a, like an actual cookbook that you could sell? Yes. Yes, actually, I have. Um, so hopefully this time next year, I can have a different conversation with you about that. Yeah. But yes, I would love to. It's just, again, I have a 17-year-old and a 13-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, they take priority over everything that I do. Uh, For sure. The, the good thing about that is, is that they're into it as well. So That's my 13-year-old awesome. daughter uh, is probably the best forager that you'll ever see. Now, it helps that she's got 13 year old eyes. Right. So, <laughs> right. Uh, so, uh, but she is in there. She helps me clean deer. She helps me forage. Uh, my son is an avid outdoorsman. Uh, he's living this summer dream life where he's, he's bow fishing and frogging every night. Uh, nice. As a matter of fact, he's coming back from the coast right now. They caught a limit of blue point crabs uh, awesome. this morning. So, I mean, he's just living the, the outdoorsman's life now, uh, uh, in between um, his junior and senior year in high school, so I, I'm 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 jealous of him and his endeavors. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, you know, and I I kind of gave him a bunch of grief about it, like. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm happy for him that he's a, he's able to do it. He's a he's an avid duck hunter. He loves duck hunting. Um, so it's really nice that you know we all share the passion together because we can do this together. You know, mm -hmm. I don't have to. Uh, you know, I, I hear stories all the time where. The families don't, you know, don't enjoy the outdoors and right. you've got to find time to go and, and make two or three hunts a year because, you know, their endeavors are, are, are elsewhere. Not with us. You know, I've got this deer camp. It's an hour away and we spend a lot of time there, the four of us, during the season. Uh, every Thanksgiving for the last, I don't know, I can't even tell you how far back, uh, we, we're at the deer camp and, uh, you know, we're eating venison. Uh, and then my son will go hunting that afternoon. So, you know, it's, I'm just fortunate and blessed that I can, uh, I can have family surrounding me nearly 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, during the season to, to, to be with me. That makes it a lot easier. <laughs> I got a, I've got yeah. a very, very supportive wife myself and she's kind of grown up. She does not hunt. And as of right now, we'll never hunt according to her. I'm going to get her into it, but, uh, <laughs> she's grown up around the guys in the family hunted. So she understands. And, and, you know, she's, 
she's watched my whole progression over the last couple of years. And like, I think she sees how much I care about it. And, uh, she's very good about not being like, you know, you're not very good at this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that, that does help a lot. So if, yeah, I'm going to keep an eye out. I'm going to obviously keep in touch with you and, and hopefully you can teach me how to make something other than bacon wrap, whatever it is. But, uh, yeah, that's exciting. And I, I look forward to that when you can get a book together and actually get it in the hands. And I tell you what, it's going to go right, right over there in my kitchen. Um, so I don't want to take any more of your time. I know you've had a long day. You just got in. So before we wrap it up, let's go back over. Where can people find you on Instagram and, and everywhere else? Okay. Edible Outdoors Cook, both Instagram and Facebook. And then Edible Outdoors Cook, Field to Cajun Table online. Uh, a Google search will get you there uh, for all three of them. Awesome. Guys, seriously, go. Again, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, I love having conversations with like-minded people. And to anybody in your audience, hit me up. If you have questions about any of it, I don't discriminate. I answer all questions. Uh, you know, It might take me a day to get to, to, to see it, actually, because I've got a full-time job. But I love I love communicating with like mean like minded people, and uh, especially people that are are trying to break into one aspect of the outdoors, fishing, hunting, foraging, uh, gardening, growing fruit trees, whatever. Hit me yeah. up. I, I I will answer all the questions. That's awesome. Um, so you guys like you really 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 need to go follow him. You need to watch what he's doing. Um. If you like looking at just amazing meals, he's putting pictures up every single day and just full of information. And like like he said, and I can vouch for it, if you got questions, hit him up. And uh, he's a great person to ask. And uh, yeah, I just, I couldn't be more thrilled to have you on here. There's just so much that, that can be learned from this. And I know I've, I've learned a ton here too. So I appreciate your time so much. Um, hey guys, if you, if you like this show, if you found value in it, Please head over, like, subscribe, follow, give the show a good rating on whatever platform you're on, and go over and check out at Antler Feather Co. on YouTube and Instagram. I put a lot of stuff out there. Um, it's going to be ramping up as we're coming up on deer season. So as always, I appreciate every single one of you guys listening, and uh, we will catch you next week for episode number four on the Antler and Feather Co. podcast. <laughs>